So you may have noticed in Professor Schetz's talk the um, use of the term um, natural experiment. That's really quite a good thing to put in any of your papers that you're writing at the moment because it seems to be a, a term that's beloved by editors. So if you put that in, your paper will get accepted. So that's the thought for the day. So I'm going to talk about biomarkers of recovery, whether we can predict stopping, whereas Alex has just talked about when we can start. These are my disclosures, some of which are to do with um, biomarker companies, but they won't be particularly relevant, as you'll see in a minute. So can we actually predict successful discontinuation from renal replacement therapy? And the answer is no. <laughs> okay. We are done. So I'd like to thank the organisers for asking me to speak <laughs> at the meeting. <laughs> so I would like to thank Claudio for inviting me to the meeting, obviously. And I think he'd be very annoyed if I didn't give you a few more slides, so you'll have to persevere with me. So timing of renal replacement therapy in the critical year was widely studied, as Alex elegantly showed you. So we're talking about start. But stopping, no one's really interested in that, and I fail to see why, really. There's limited information, and there's few recommendations for when to discontinue renal replacement therapy. And I suppose that figures, really. We can go to these two Bibles. There's the Cadigo guidelines, which you've heard mentioned already, and there's the uh, um, NICE guidance from the UK, the acute kidney injury um, guidance that we have to follow. And if we just look at what Cadigo say, they say discontinue renal replacement therapy when it is no longer needed or no longer required. Well, thank you very much. So it doesn't really help us, does it? So they do point out a few other things, some research recommendations. So we should determine clinical parameters that predict, predict discontinuation. That seems very reasonable to me. Um, identify and determine biomarkers that may indicate renal recovery, which we may have some in the future, and determine more reliable predictors of long-term outcomes, which may be related to the two. <clears throat> so where else can we go, go for guidance? Well, perhaps we should ask the Holy Trinity. Well, here's two of the Holy Trinity. Unfortunately, one's missing, but here he is to give us his guidance. So let's see what John, um, Claudio, Ronaldo think. This is a consensus um, conference that was written up just over two years ago now, renal replacement therapy and acute kidney injury. So quite a few years after the Cadigo guidance, and what do they say about stopping renal replacement therapy? Well, how this can be evaluated and how we can work out when to stop renal replacement therapy is still receiving RRT remains unclear. So we really haven't progressed at all. And I think it's important to consider certain questions when we're considering cessation of therapy. First of all, we have to define what we mean. And I know that sounds you know, really bloody obvious, but if you look at a lot of the papers, they don't really define what discontinuation means. And then we have to consider when we should even consider stopping. And finally, can we predict successful discontinuation? So this is a kind of flow chart that you could imagine um, your patient here. They might be on continuous therapies. They would be on my unit because that's all I allow. So we have continuous therapies. And then we may consider stopping, right? And then we may consider various factors. Then we stop. And if we remain off treatment, we would class that as successful cessation. Now, in some units... This bit here, the considering stopping, may involve a transition of modality. So you may have continuous here, and then you may go to a PERT-type system or an intermittent therapy. And then you can go various ways, can't you? If you've messed it up, you'll end up back here. If the patient's unfortunate, they'll end up here. And they may stop, or they may stop for a bit and then come back here. Right? So you may have a mod modality transition, and any of this can apply here. Also, because you may stop and fail and come back here. Now, of course, sometimes this can't be predicted. Because you know, if your patient deteriorates, 
then you may have to go back on renal replacement therapy. So it's important to remember that 100% prediction is probably highly unlikely. So I think how we can, uh, I would define it, is in the same way that your patients would define it. That successful cessation means no more renal replacement therapy. And I think that's simple, but it's probably what they think, is it? And so not restarting RRT, to me, is successful cessation. So when do we have to consider stopping? So clearly, they should have stopped a little bit earlier here. So when should we do it in our patients? Well, I think you have to address three questions before you can consider cessation of treatment. Has the original precipitant for AKI resolved? Now, again, this sounds incredibly obvious, but when I was a, a fellow, and I had my own teeth and slightly different coloured hair many years ago, I remember a patient being transferred for renal replacement therapy from another hospital. And I decided we would look at the kidneys and do an ultrasound scan. And I had bilateral hydronephrosis because the surgeon who'd repaired the aneurysm had decided to stitch the ureters to the wall of the abdomen. And so, you know, you've really got to make sure that the original precipitant has resolved. Then, is there some evidence of degree of recovery of renal function? So, the most obvious one to look at is urine output. For me, it's urine output. And then, importantly, has fluid overload been resolved? We've heard repeatedly about the bad effects of, the, of um, volume overload throughout the last few days, and so if your patient's still swollen, you probably shouldn't consider stopping. And I think if you haven't addressed those questions, then you're going to do your patient a disservice because successful cessation is probably unlikely. So let's have a look at the studies that have tried to address this difficult problem. You won't be able to read this, but it, we'll look at some of the studies in more detail. Really. But these are the study types. And you can see there's very few that perspective. Most of them are retrospective single set of co cohorts. This is the modalities used, so continuous and intermittent, and combination of some. One of the papers here doesn't even tell us which modality was used. These are the predictors of successful discontinuation from the papers. And they all have one thing in common. All of them look at the urine and that's what tells them how to discontinue renal replacement therapy. So a functional biomarker rather than injurious one. And personally, because I now just do ITU, but I was trained as a nephrologist, it's kind of ironic, really, isn't it? That, you know, urine in this aspect of a care is the focus of attention, but quite often it's completely ignored by everyone else. So if you go and see someone with acute kidney injury and ask them if someone's dipstick the urine, they look at you as if you've got two heads. So here, you know, we're really concentrating on urine. So let's just have a brief look at four of these papers and see if we can make any sense of it. This was a, a retrospective um, post hoc analysis from the best kidney study, of which some of the authors are in this room, so I'd better say very nice things about it. And actually... It was quite a useful paper, and it pointed us in the right direction, which it told us, after multiple LR analysis, that urine output was a very good predictor, or appeared to be a good predictor, for discontinuation, a successful discontinuation of renal replacement therapy. And then we see in the conclusions here, urine output at the time of cessation of CRRT was the most important predictor of successful discontinuation. It doesn't say it's 100% at predicting, but he said of the parameters looked at, that was the most important one. So increased urine output, successful discontinuation. So this is a paper from France, um, Professor Cluche's um, group here. And the title kind of tells you the end message. Daily urinary creatinine predicts the weaning of RRT. And what they did, and it shows you how difficult this study is, really. They looked again at retrospective case lengths. 438 patients here treated by RRT. They made sure to wheedle this down to 54 patients who were analysed. And you were either put in the S plus group, which was successful weaning, or S minus, which had failed. What did that actually mean? Well, it did define what they meant. So S plus meant you're more than 15 days off continuous therapies. 
That might not be what your patient wants to see. Your patient wants to see never you need it again, but more than 15 days. And failed was more than three days off, but less than 15. And the reason they picked three is because they measured various parameters. And this is the group they looked at, and they were similar, and there was no major differences between the two. <coughs> this was the criteria before they attempted weaning. And it's very similar to the things I was mentioning earlier. So they had to have a fairly impressive um, urine output, stable hemodynamics, stable retrieval status, no new kidney injury, and this bit made me laugh, actually, no need to continue renal replacement therapy. Well, OK, so if they thought that, then they clearly don't need anything to predict it because they can tell the future. But still, that, so that was their criteria for a, attempted weaning. And what they did at day, naught, day one and day two after cessation was measure the non-renal sofa, urine output, they looked at um, doses of furosemide given together with volume balance and need to map pressors, ventilation, etc., as well as urinary parameters. And to cut to the chase, really, the most important parameters they found was the urea clearance, the creatinine clearance, the urinary urea excretion, and the urinary creatinine excretion. And these were the kind of rock curves they demonstrated. This is for um, urine output, so not a particularly good predictor on its own. And they did some subgroups looking at whether they were taking diuretics or not, but I won't go into that. And this is a model built up in the 24-hour urinary, uh, urinary creatinine cessation. And the upshot of this paper is that the diuresis was similar between the fouled and the successful groups, but the 24-hour urinary urea excretion and creatinine excretion was higher in the successful group. And the most important parameter they found was a 24-hour urinary creatinine excretion. So 5.2 millimetres, uh, millimoles, sorry, over 24 hours was associated with successful weaning. So I'm supposed to talk about biomarkers. Urine is, of course, a very good functional biomarker, but this is um, looking at biomarkers that are more beloved, um, looking upon um, biomarkers upon discontinuation of renal replacement therapy, predicting 60-day survival and renal recovery. So these are papers that get lumped together as being successful discontinuation. And I think things begin to blur here. Because you know, are the biomarkers predicting discontinuation or are they predicting um, outcome? And I think you know, people kind of lose sense sometimes. This is a paper, a, a study that enrolled 102 patients and they measured various um, biomarkers associated with acute kidney injury. So osteopontin, which is used by some, interleukins, cystatin and engal in both serum and urine. And they collected the samples 24 hours after they stopped renal replacement therapy. And the criteria they used, again, trend towards decreasing serum creatinine, urine output of greater than 400 mils in 24 hours, right? very similar to 20 mils an hour in the previous study, improved fluid overload and improved electrolyte and metabolic state. So all fairly obvious, really. And the primary outcome was 60-day um, survival. This is the cohort diagram. So after they excluded patients, they had 223. Interestingly, you see 72 had to reinitiate um, arenas for RRT during follow-up. So before they got to their final cohort. So within 24 hours, some went back. And 49 died with the acute um, with need for um, further RRT. So there's certainly evidence that if you do fail renal replacement therapy cessation, you do less well. That's probably... Not completely, but probably related to the fact that something else has happened. So if you go down to the bottom here, we had 50 who recovered and 19 who didn't. And what they found was lower biomarker on cessation of um, renal replacement therapy predicted a better outcome. Well, it's not entirely surprising. And this was um, serum osteopontin here. And they did various uh, predictive modellings and showed rock curves which predicted improved 60-day mortality, which isn't really the same as predicting whether you're going to be off renal replacement therapy for life. But if you're not on it in 60 days, you're probably in a good place. The important thing to look at, of course, is also the acuity of the patients. And if you look at the survivors compared to the non-survivors, well, surprise, surprise, the non-survivors were sicker. And if you just look at the Apache 2 score, you know, it was 27 in the non-survivors compared to 20 in the survivors. SOFA was also lower, and the need for mechanical ventilation and pressors was. So you could kind of see they were a separate or a different cohort, and certainly the non-survivors 
was sicker. So this is probably the only paper, I would say, in the literature that looks at a biomarker as a predictor for weaning. And so what this group did, um, they looked at BMP and whether it was predictive of weaning from CRRT. Took 160 patients and they did BMP measurements and then stratified people into high BMP and low BMP. I won't go into how they did it. But they looked at weaning from continuous therapies within um, two weeks and complete or partial recovery from acute kidney injury. And so, you know, the group that weaned are here and they had a cumulative survival rate that was certainly better than those that failed, as you can see over time. And if you look at Engel, there was very little difference in terms of predicting outcome and successful cessation of um, RRT, but certainly BNP seemed to predict an improved outcome. And these are the Kaplan-Meier curves here. And if you look again at the predictability, this is predictability of weaning from RRT within the patient groups. Well, for some reason, there was a few more men. The Apache score was predicted, so the lower the Apache, the better you were going to do. The creatinine, the urine output once more, and the BMP. So if your BMP was higher, you were less likely to survive um, cessation from RRT. So several urinary biomarkers have been looked at. And in the future, they may well be integrated models that could predict renal recovery and outcome of acute kidney injury. Some of you may, well, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of the SAFIRE study. Well, following on from that, there's the RUBY study, which is looking at biomarkers of recovery from um, acute kidney injury, the results of which we hope to see this year. I can't tell you what the um, biomarker is because I don't know what it is, and none of us do yet because we're being kept in the dark, but hopefully, certainly in Vicenza next year, you'll find out what it is. So studies have also shown that patients with lower elision levels of biomarkers are more likely to recover kidney function. Well, it kind of, it's a self-prophecy, really, self-fulfilling prophecy. But plasma um, BMP at the initiation of CRRT has been found to be a weaning-related factor, but again, that probably reflects um, a severity of illness, and that studies that focus more on a differentiation between transient and persistent AKI. So I can see Patrick looking at me, so I better shut up. So, in summary, really, the best thing to look at at the moment in terms of cessation is a catheter bag. So if you've got urine in there, then you've probably got a better chance 